thank you, everybody, for your, for your presentations um, today. Um, I'm, like I said, this is really a, a cross-sector panel. We have uh, technologists, we have uh, people who understand government, people who've worked with government. Uh, we have NGOs, private sector representatives here. So uh, hopefully we can get a broad uh, set of um, experiences shared here. Um, so I'd like to um, start uh, by ask, actually I'll start with you, um, Kate. Um, you mentioned as part of the experience that you have, um, you know, uh, working, working with government. Um, and I, I'm curious, um, have you seen um, government policy actually impacted by the work that CADASTA or OpenStreetMap or governments actually adapting the way that they do things uh, based on the work um, that you've done using technology? Has that change actually happened? Is it something that we just dream but doesn't actually materialize? OpenStreetMap started out of the UK, and the reason was the government maps there were very expensive. You had to purchase ordin ordinance survey maps. And, uh, for a, and, and for a university research project, that was cost prohibitive. So the idea of we'll just make our own maps came along. And in the past few years, the ordnance survey has started to have more and more open data. And part of that is directly that pressure from OpenStreetMap that if you don't release data, people will find other ways to create it. Uh, I, I think that's the best example of it. Uh, in a lot of my other work, it often has been more of the government putting pressure on what we were trying to do and then we have to adapt. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, when I first began working there in 2011 with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, a law was passed, and it was a 100-page law, but the part that scared us, to summarize it down, was if you distribute inaccurate data, you go to jail. And it very briefly was going to stop all of our mapping. But so what we started doing is we started meeting with the National Mapping Agency there fairly regularly. And what ended up, one of the results of that, and not my group just alone, but all of the community mapping happening in Indonesia, was the development of a participatory one map policy. And what that policy was, was giving a path for community-based mapping to make its way into the national map. Uh, I'm returning to Jakarta uh, next week because uh, I actually haven't had an update on this policy uh, uh, on the participatory one map work in a while, and I'm excited to see where it's gone uh, because you know the work we were doing directly influenced them that they were thinking, okay, well this map is going to happen anyway. How do we take advantage of that? Sounds like. Uh a familiar experience, countries you now passing laws to really protect how information um, is shared. Um, uh, but uh, I'd be curious to know ex exactly how <laughs> it goes in, in Indonesia. Um, I'll move to you, uh, JD. Um, you talked a lot about working in, in communities. And um, my question to you is really how or what strategies do you find most effective to help you connect with the communities that Codebridge uh, works with? Um, in South Africa? Um, yeah, so um, as a software developer, I don't do a lot of that community work, um, so I don't do that so much directly. Um, one of the things we're trying to do at CodeBridge is to, like I mentioned, we're trying to stimulate a, a civic technology movement. And um, what doesn't work is just telling people, hi, we're here, come, come to us. Um, and we need to work on that. Um, we. So this particular pro project or, or approach I'm, I'm talking about is um, we thought coders want to have a place where they can go and, and play with technology and build stuff. And I think that's, that's true. But just, just telling people how we're here, putting it on a meetup group um, isn't working. Um, some of the other things we're doing is um, we started sort of with hackathons and then started having unhackathons because um, in a, in a hackathon, the idea is usually like you want to just build an app, um, but, but the focus there is the app. And then we started having these unhackathons to take the emphasis off just building something. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and usually we try to throw together maybe some journalists because uh, data journalism is a, is a big approach for us to, to inform the communities. Um, so we bring technologists and we bring uh, journalists and we bring some domain experts, perhaps some people who work with, with children's problems or something and uh, try to identify stories instead and see how when, when we're using technology, how we can tell the stories better and find the stories better. Um, and, and that's actually extremely successful. Uh, but, but it has to be a very guided pro process and, and the expectations have to be set properly to, to say it's not about um, just building some, something and using technology. Uh, perhaps technology is a small thing and one of my favorite parts of, of a project like this where we were trying to inform people about um, uh, their rights when they're participating in a protest is um, that we considered, strongly considered making a, a paper-based game um, you don't necessarily need technology at the end of solution. It's, it could be just part of the process. So what you're also suggesting is you know, the use of um, infomediaries so that you don't have to reach, do the outreach yourself, get somebody who already has the network sync community and work with them as opposed to trying to do it yourself. That's an extremely fundamental part of this uh, project with Black Sash that I mentioned. Um, and even they, as a national human rights organization with a lot of respect from communities, they're not doing the monitoring themselves. Communities are very um, private, actually. And, and if, if other people come in and try to do monitoring there, it's not going to work. They try to support local um, organizations that are part of the community and from the community uh, so that they are doing the actual interaction. Uh, it even takes time to set up a relationship with those organizations, but um, as far as possible, getting locals to actually do the, the bulk of the, the work that, that is contact with the community. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, JD. I'll move over to Pim. Very similar question. I mean, you shared some very impressive numbers. Two, uh, only two months old, already stupid, uh, six, 6 6.5 million contributions on, on your platform. Um, what, what, what is it um, that makes people want to contribute? Um, and there are m many other mapping platforms, for instance. Why do you think so many are contributing to, to yours? Okay, so, so first of all, it's not necessarily my platform. It's, it's, it's missing maps that basically runs everything. I'm just a developer. Um, However, um, I was a, a big part um, of the design process, and uh, one of the things we really wanted to continuously stress was um, people needed to feel like they were part of the mission in order to make this successful. And the way we did that is by, by, by telling a story. And the way we told the story is by using compelling imagery, uh, is by having people who actually are in the field working on these things, uh, you know, tell their story and, and put that on the missions that we distribute through MapSwipe. And we notice that if people feel like they are part of the mission, like they're actually contributing to something that they, um, that they feel has, has an impact, they actually come back more often than they come back to a lot of different apps. Um, like we've, we've compared our retention numbers to other apps and we've noticed that we are, we are higher than a lot of them. We're, we're like in the top sort of 75% percentile where people spend sometimes more than 20 minutes a day on our app. Uh, we've, we've had a point at the beginning when we launched it, spent more than 20 minutes a day every day. Every user spent on average 20 minutes a day, which was really, really high. Um, and what makes them do this is, like I said, part of the mission, um, then there's also part of us that's human where we do forget about things and, uh, and we do forget uh, what we're doing and you know, other parts of life that are busier take over. So that's where the regular retention strategies that you have actually also around mobile apps and mobile games come in, which is where you use, for, for example, notifications, and, um, and personal goals such as badges and levels in order to get people to feel like they're part of a track. Um, and that in combination with being part of the mission and having notifications remind you of when your help is needed uh, actually has created you know, this amazing results for us. If my phone rings, I'm more likely to want to <laughs> um, get right on um, you know, addressing whatever it is that has popped up. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, that's interesting. Thank you, uh, Pim. Um, Zarina, you, I hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> um, you work with, with local, local authorities. And I, I was, as you were giving your presentation, I was thinking about my own local authority in Nairobi um, that 
we're, we're going into an election year, so obviously things are really um, heated. Um, a couple of friends started off an initiative, you know, um, just, just to try and get, for, for instance, all the, the status of all the roads, uh, because it was one of the campaign uh, promises, um, and now put them on online. What are, what are the status? Which ones have actually been repaired? Which ones haven't been repaired? Which ones um, uh, does the government claim to have repaired, but nothing has actually happened? And I was maybe wondering, now from a local authority's um, perspective, um, what kind of, of, of maps um, would you say would be most relevant uh, what kind of information are local governments looking for in maps that we can uh, provide to them? Okay, um, as local governments, we're talking about subnational governments closest to the communities. Number one, the data should be as disaggregated as possible. Um, the trends with open data all across the country is that you know central government makes it available in big bunches of uh, data sets. But very few initiatives really get to break it down to the smallest unit of uh, government. And the disaggregation should also coincide with the design of local authorities in your countries. Um, for instance, our education data is in the Philippines is disaggregated per, per district. And each district can either be a province, a provincial government, or a city government. So now, it, you know, there has to be the, the correlation of what data feeds to whom has to be very purposive. So that's one. This aggregation under that is purposiveness of uh, who is it for. Another one would be the data should also be sensitive to policies surrounding whatever nature of what you're mapping. For instance, we go to roads. We also have that here in the Philippines. It's the Open Roads Project, supported by the World Bank. Um, it's tied with the Calzada. It's literally road, Calzada. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tied to the Calzada project of the government. However, when people report the status of the roads there, and when the, the data is connected with other road mapping uh, applications. It doesn't trigger the right kind of citizen action because citizens don't know that the roads are classified according to levels of responsibility. You know, main highways are with the national government, secondary roads are with this level of government, your farm to market roads are with your municipal government, and your walkways, your small area road with barangay. We've had instances that people in the communities would use the information and go to their village chairperson, and the village per chairperson would say, I have no funds to answer to this. You go to the mayor. And, and, and that doesn't suit well with a citizen who wants now to engage government because if you don't understand the policy behind the data, you just feel that government didn't respond enough. So for those who are designing the data and, and trying to put some trigger into citizen response and government response, please also reach out to those who can guide you to, to frame the data in ways that make specific what policy or what action you're trying to trigger in the process. I guess um, that's a common uh, mistake that citizens make in terms of even knowing who um, um, is in charge of which kind of road. Uh, but interestingly, we have uh, examples of <laughs> sometimes when the people in government that you're reaching out to are not actually quite sure which agency is actually responsible for which kind of road. So I guess it's a problem that can be um, escalated. Selena, I'll come to you, but I'd like us to take some questions from the, from the floor. Um, there's one here. Is there any other? I'd ask you to please stand up and put the mic as close to the mouth as possible so that we can see you and for our audience that is live streaming as well. No? 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 Yes. Now, yes. Thank you. Really, I'm really happy to have uh, all these humanitarian geeks working together here. You know? I, want, uh, I want to ask all of you one tweet, one phrase, one advice to the people who is just starting 
in crisis mapping. You know, sometimes crisis mapping gets so, so confused, so, so hard to be understood. So I want that you please share with the people who is just starting in this process, one tweet. What do they need to do? Which advice can you share with all of, of the people that is just starting? Thank you very much. So, right. oh, go ahead. I'd actually like us to take, two, is there any other question so that we answer both at the same time? All right, maybe, go ahead, go ahead. So, um, so I got started in crisis mapping, I wanna say three years ago, or no, it may have been two, it was actually during Typhoon Haiyan um, when, when I got started with Luis. Um, and one of the main things that I found was that you can't assume anything. Um, once you get started developing, it's all really exciting and sometimes your team's emotion takes over in a way where, um, where people start making assumptions as to what the people on the ground are doing. And um, it's, for us, it was always the most important thing to work directly with NGOs or, or governments to, to solve these challenges. I never assume that this is, some, this is the way something happens because once you start assuming, it becomes really hard for the people that are going to use your technology to actually like it because a lot of the times these assumptions just go completely the wrong way. So if you're gonna build technology for crisis mapping or for any sort of disaster or any uh, humanitarian purpose, in my opinion, work really closely with the NGOs. Otherwise, it's very unlikely that your technology will be used by them. Yeah, so my tagline would be pre present your data according to the story you'd like, you're trying to tell. Um, because if you're presenting data to an analyst, they, they need all the layers of the map and they need everything and all the detail. But if you're trying to present data to an end user, um, like I said before, I think they, they know where they live. What they need to know is, is the, the local details and perhaps an overview just to put things into context. Try not to reinvent things. Uh, so I've been involved, so I was involved with Crisis Commons in 2009, before the earthquake in Haiti, before crisis mapping really had become a big thing. The first crisis mappers conference had happened at that point, but that was it. And we would go to these hackathons and people would want to make the same solutions over and over again. Do you know how many times people have written their own version of Ushahidi <laughs> and didn't even realize it existed? And so part of that is you have to listen and work with others because the problem, if you haven't been a humanitarian worker or been a victim of a disaster or really been involved before, your first idea has probably already been thought of. You might need to work on your seventh idea but you have to get to that first. On our end on uh, government, um, this is informed by my experience with Typhoon Haiyan. We were there with the agencies and we didn't know if our mayors were alive. I mean, that level of lack of information. And the, the weeks, the, day, uh, the days after the onslaught of the storm was so horrible. You, didn't, uh, you get phone calls from, from them. They, they would ask you, you know, we haven't eaten for three days. And, and you don't know which information to get at certain points. So for crisis mappers, and, 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 and following that, there were so many groups approaching us. That, you know, we can do this for you. We can do this for you. We can do all of these for you, especially for the app developers. We can map this. We can plot this. We can etc. My advice is to not do that. <laughs> My advice is when you go approach someone you'd like to work with, people's organizations or government, be specific what you want to do with us. Meaning if you, I mean, some of them were saying that we'll try to map out all the donations coming in. I was like, seriously, all of the donations coming in? It's like, we're, we'll try, we're, we're going to try to map where the, where the, the goods, the relief goods are coming in at which parts. I was like, seriously? Do you have people there in the parts that you can do that? Sometimes the most useful um, innovations that we can eventually absorb in the, in the government side are those that are very specific and very tailor-fitted to what is needed by the crisis. 
So at that point, what we didn't need complicated maps. We didn't need overlays of whatever. At that point, we need the basic information that this information comes from this one. This information comes from this one. We didn't, had, we didn't have that before. Now, of course, we're better <laughs> coming from the learning. But the lesson there is that if you want to work with government, you want to work with, with um, community organizations, be specific what the technology is for. The technology does not precede the demand. The demand always precedes the response. Uh, on the map pH perspective, a lot of the replication duplication is what exactly we're trying to avoid here. So, I mean, our data is only as good as the data that you provide to us. So the first step we would ask is to check mapph.com. And for the Philippines, see what data layers are already there versus going out in the field, doing your own survey, and trying to see how you can be helpful first by contacting the other partners before actually deploying in the field. Our concern is the impact to communities where you have a, a family who's suffered loss during a disaster and they have you know, some 20 year old asking them the same questions over and over again, how many people in their family died. So it is a lot of stress in the community. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with helping that alleviation. For very new mappers, of course, we recommend Map Swipe um, to be able to just get the flow of uh, visualizing, looking at how you can contrib contribute to visualizing data. And there are Learn OSM modules online. So the Youth Mappers Network is one way that you can get involved. We have our training programs on MapPH we'll, that we'll be announcing as well. So just uh, being able to find topics that are of interest to you because you want us to continue with mapping and continue along the spectrum and hopefully um, learn more mapping skills. So find something that you are passionate about because luckily we're mapping everything. So there's got to be something that we map that you like that you can help with. Let's hold on to that mic, Selena. Um, you mentioned in your, and thank you everybody for, I hope your <laughs> uh, question has been answered. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you, know, you work with representatives from, you know, well, it's really a cross-sector approach. You have NGOs, you have businesses, you have maybe religious organizations and so on. I'm wondering what is the kind of uptake um, from each of these sectors? Is, there, is the demand higher in some over the others? How, uh, what, what has been your, uh, what have you observed in your work um, so far in terms of demand for uh, the maps that you're uh, producing? Well, so far so good. We've had a really tremendous response from across the sectors. Um, case in point here, our venue here is from Unilab, um, who are the biggest pharmaceutical company um, in, in the Philippines and in Asia. And, you know, they're the big healthcare provider. And they see the need in mapping and being able to prioritize where their services are. Um, everybody seems to be from across the sectors really interested in accurate data. We have many challenges with accurate barangay or village boundaries, municipal boundaries. So at the first point of business, at the first point of even understanding where you can deliver that aid, we need those maps. So by being able to complete that data and share that data with us, it's already instantly, we need that right away. Um, second is the coordination of that. So being able to see that everybody has limited resources, we have such limited infrastructure, you see how our traffic is, that we really have to work better together. And also to implement programs in a linear fashion, because it's not for the lack of services oftentimes. We have so many people that want to help the Philippines, so much funding, and yet not a platform to really help um, apply it in a linear fashion where you've got consultation and then you've got planning, the program, the training, equipment. These are all happening at different times, so we really want to help um, aggregate that method from the government. As I mentioned, we are working on that. Very excited to work on the open data bill as it relates to sustainable development goals. Um, on the business sector, we have the largest corporation who is also one of our uh, title sponsors for this conference. They are from the banking sector to real estate to healthcare and education. Um, they are the leading organization in the country and there are 150,000 employees. We are working on a data partnership agreement because as I mentioned, business continuity is key on everybody's minds. Being able to quickly um, jump back into operating when we have these conflicts and crises um, and uh, disasters and uh, stresses of climate change. So everybody's recognizing that we need a very new model. They love being able to work more in real time and understanding everybody has limited resources that free mapping, maps that work offline. Uh, we're also providing, uh, we're working on a program nationally to provide satellite feeds so that even if you don't have internet 
access or cell phone access through our one-way satellite feed, you can at least access our information and information from 150 websites. Um, so that level of access, free maps, free online training, and the opportunity to be able to fine-tune your operations and supply chain really resonates with everybody because more information really helps um, whatever your background. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're out of time, so uh, I think we'll ask if there are any other questions, maybe we can see some of the panelists um, after this. But I just want to hear your final word. If you have one final word, um, from each one of the panelists, maybe you can, you can just share. We'll just go um, around again. Maybe we'll start with Selena this time. Mm -hmm. If you have one final word, um, to, to close this panel, maybe we'll start and, and, and go in, in that direction this time as we close this panel. Yes, yeah. so we're only as good as the data that you give us. So help us, help you, create a profile. You can request needs from your community, whether it's public or private sector, the more data we have, the more our funders will see it. We're hoping that it will impact policy um, and to provide more rapid um, mobilization of aid. So please help us share your data online, mapph.com. Thank you. Sarina? Um, begin with your end in mind. Start designing, start conceptualizing. Be specific as to what change or reform you want to happen. Um, in any part of the disaster risk reduction or crisis situation that you're conceptualizing for? Um, so for me, it's, it's actually something that I heard throughout um, what you, Selena, said, and you, Kate, uh, is that you should always you know, design your technology and whatever you build for the people that are going to use it. So if you're going to work on something, like Kate said, do you really do your research on what already exists? and really try to work with the NGOs in order to build it, and then you are very likely that people will actually use it. And li listen to the people already doing things and um, see where the needs are. Uh, it's about the, the not doing duplication and hearing where the government is already trying to work. Chances are there's someone in government who's really eager to disseminate the information that you're trying to collect or disseminate. And um, so, so work with them. And if, if they're not positive initially, don't be discouraged. They've probably seen 100 people go, like, I'm going to solve this thing. And then they sort of fall away quickly. Because there are many people with great ideas that don't follow through. So take it easy. Don't be discouraged. Listen to, to, to the problems that need solving. And, and that's where you need to work. And try and solve a small problem so that you have the energy to actually complete that. Let's work together. I think. You know, generally within this group, we work together pretty well, but we still sometimes end up with silos. So let's see how we can combine our software and our efforts to be the most effective. Brilliant. Uh, that's a great place to end it. So thank you very much, Kate, JD, Pim, uh, Zarina, Selena. Been a wonderful panel. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And yes, enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Thank you. <laughs>